crowds and to his disciples. The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts, and the best seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the marketplaces, and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourself nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that is made gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar, swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple, swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven, swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, First clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones, and all who also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then, and measure up and measure of your fathers. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Rakia, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is, is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And this is God's word. Let's pray. Lord, we ask you tonight to lead us into all truth, as you said your spirit would. So Lord, tonight... Open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts, that we would see you more closely, Lord, and more clearly, and Lord, that by the power of your Spirit, through the truth of your Word, we would be transformed. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a, just a quick um, 
note, I meant to mention this during the announcements, and that is, um, this is the first service of the new year. Um, you might typically get a New Year's looking forward message tonight. We're saving that for the 18th. That's our annual business meeting, vision casting, looking forward, all that stuff going on that night. So tonight we're picking up where we left off in Matthew, and it just so happens that we started out with the passage known as the seven woes. What a woe, what a way to start uh, 2015. But I, I think we know well enough, if, you, if you've been here for any length of time, that no matter where we are in the text, that, that Jeff and I aren't here to stand up and teach you the Bible. We're here to stand up and proclaim Christ from every page of the Bible. And so that's what we're doing here. And even in the seven woes, it's my hope that what we'll see is, is the glory and the grace and the love of our Savior, even as he's rebuking the heck out of the Pharisees and the scribes. So, with that said, um, one of my, my favorite intros, superhero movies have been um, a part of movies, or have been a part of our lives as long as movies have in general. Um, we had the, if you think back, we had the, the Superman series in the 80s, the Batman series that started in the 90s, still going. But there really was a craze on superhero movies that started around 2002 with the Spider-Man series uh, starring Tobey Maguire and then D Disney Marvel has just kind of taken it to another level um, with a whole bunch of those movies. And, and maybe the Iron Man series was the most popular. Uh, the acting talents of Robert Downey Jr. helped. Um, but the movies themselves, I don't, I don't know if you think that they were as great as I thought they were, but they're pretty good. Um, and, and maybe, though, the first one of them all was the best, right? You had the arrogant, rude, and sometimes crude uh, billionaire genius, Tony Stark, who ha doesn't really care how his inventions are being used as long as they make lots of money, right? And then he, he gets caught up in a military firefight and almost dies while he's out in the desert demonstrating his latest weaponry. But somehow, he survives and he manages to escape with this new armored suit that he's created while he was in captivity, right? Great story so far, but it, it doesn't end there. Tony, now that he's escaped, wants to turn over a new leaf as a result of his experience, and he wants to get out of the arms business, and he wants all of his inventions to be used only for good. That is until his right-hand man, Obadiah Stane, comes and wants to talk some sense into him, say, hey, you know what that's going to do to the stock prices if we get out of the arms business? You can't do that. Obadiah was Tony's father, his late father's business partner, and has been Tony's business coach and, and trusted confidant through all of his growing up. But unfortunately, it turns out that Obadiah is anything but a friend. He's actually the one who arranged for Tony to be attacked in the field, and he was supposed to be killed. But, you know, all of this is boiling to a head. In the meantime, Tony's tinkering around, perfects his Iron Man suit, and it all comes to a grand finale with Tony and Obadiah, and of course, Iron Man emerges victorious. We all sail off into the sunset until Iron Man 2, right? That's the way it works. Now, my point is not to just live the awesomeness of the Iron Man story. That's just an added benefit to be able to relive that. But my point is to point my, my point here is to look at the character of Obadiah, right? In the story, he appears to be Tony's friend. He pretends to have Tony's best interest in mind. He plays the part well. Meanwhile, all along, he was only interested in seizing power and protecting and promoting himself. Obadiah was pretending to be something that he wasn't. And that was especially harsh because he was somebody that Tony trusted. Well, tonight, we're going to see Jesus dealing with a group of people who had the same problem. They were pretenders, right? They had the same problem as Obadiah Stane. They were pretenders. And these were also trusted people, trusted by the Jews as religious and spiritual leaders that were supposed to be leading the nation. And as we see Jesus dealing with them, he doesn't actually unleash an Iron Man suit on them. 
But when you hear how it all turns out, it might have been better for them if he had. Um, and you'll see what I mean in just a minute. But So as Jesus is rebuking them tonight, we're going to look at a couple of specific things in his address as he's dealing with this issue of pretending or what we commonly call hypocrisy. And as we do, we're going to look at 39 verses. There's a whole lot going on in those 30, 39 verses, so we have to narrow what we're going to look at. We're just going to look at three things. Here they, here they are. Number one, Jesus explains what hypocrisy is and what it does. Number two, Jesus reveals the alternative and the cure for hypocrisy. And finally, Jesus shows us how unchecked hypocrisy eventually plays out. So those are the three things. That's the progression through the text. So let's go ahead. Let me pray one more time quickly, and then we'll get started. Lord, as we open the text, as we look to your word, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to see ourselves. Lord, to see those areas that we might struggle with. And Lord, to see how you have come to rescue us, even from ourselves. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So before I get into the meat of the text, let me just remind you, it's been a few weeks since we've been in Matthew, but where we catch up with Jesus and his disciples is that they're still on the Temple Mount. You may remember a few weeks ago, Jesus rode um, across the Kidron Valley from the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem through the Eastern Gate onto the Temple Mount. And since he's been there, he cursed a fig tree outside the temple, and he's gone into the temple courts, flipped over the money changers' tables, caused quite a ruckus. He's been teaching there, and this is a continuation of what he's been doing. So as Jesus is there, he's now going to address, he's going to explain what hypocrisy is and what it does. Verse 1. Then Jesus said to the crowd and to his disciples, the scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seats. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. So one, one thing worth noting here is that Jesus is actually addressing the crowds and his disciples together. If you remember over the last few chapters of Matthew, he often does that separately. He's often pulling his disciples aside to address them specifically about issues in, in the kingdom, training them for the ministry ahead, and then kind of addressing the crowds and parables. But Jesus brings them together, and I think there's significance there, and that is because the danger of hypocrisy is no respecter of persons. Right? It affects the religious and the irreligious, the Christian and the non-Christian, because it's really a heart issue, and because all of our hearts are stained with sin, hypocrisy can affect all of us. And then we see Jesus doing something that he doesn't do very often. He's, he actually gives the scribes and Pharisees a little bit of respect, right? He says, they sit on the seat of Moses. They have a position of authority. So listen to what they say, right? They're worth listening to. The scribes and the Pharisees, they knew their Old Testament Bibles. They even knew what it meant. But that's where it ends. Because even though they knew their Bibles and they knew what it meant, they were unchanged by what it said. And we see that in what Jesus does next. He said, it's okay to listen to them. It's okay to hear what they have to say. It's even okay to do what they tell you to do. But whatever you do, avoid their works. Avoid them like the plague. And then Jesus tells us why. And as he tells us why we need to avoid what the scribes and Pharisees were doing, he kind of gives us what I would call the working definition of hypocrisy or what it means to be a hypocrite. He says they preach, but they don't practice. Their walk and their talk don't match. You might have heard before that the word hypocrite actually has a meaning of a stage actor, somebody who's on the stage in a, in a Greek tragedy or a Greek play, and, and it certainly carries that meaning. But really, by the time Jesus walked the shores of the Galilee, it, it carried a meaning very much, it, it was also used very much in the same way we use it today. It would mean something along the lines of a pretender, somebody pretending to be someone they're not. And that's exactly how Jesus is using it here. 
And it, though he doesn't actually use the term hypocrite until verse 13 to describe them, before he pulls out the H word in all of its glory, he's going to use it a few times, he's kind of letting everybody know that it's coming. And, and as he prepares them, one thing that we'll notice, and one thing that I certainly noticed as I was reading through this, is that Jesus is referring back, as we read through this chapter, we see Jesus pointing back to Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7, what's what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And, and he continues to point back to those things that he taught there. He shows the Pharisees that they certainly weren't following what he had said. And in many cases, they're doing just the opposite. And I'll show you what I mean as we go. Let's pick it up in verse 4. They tie, they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to move them with a finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. For they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. Phylacteries, in case you don't know, those if you've ever seen an Orthodox Jew, they're, they're these little boxes that actually contain scriptures. And they, they take the scripture seriously to put, keep them in front of your eyes. So they, they tie it on their forehead, tie it on their hands. And so apparently these guys were getting like big old giant Macy's boxes so everybody could see and they would think they were holy. So... He's kind of pointing that out. And, and they love the places of honor at the feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace and being called rabbi by others. And so Jesus now starts cranking up the heat, right? He, he's getting really specific now about what the scribes and the Pharisees were doing that was so hypocritical. And it's nothing that he hasn't already talk about, right? He's, as I mentioned already, he's pointing back to the Sermon on the Mount. In verse 4, he's, he's, he's kind of railing on them for laying this heavy religious burden on people. And not only is it a burden that they themselves couldn't keep, they have no intention of even trying to keep it. They're holding other people to a standard higher than they were able or willing to live themselves. And if you think back to chapter 7 of Matthew and the Sermon on the Mount, the passage about judge not, and then followed by the golden rule, both of those are talking about treating others in a way that you would like to be treated, judging others by a standard that you would like to be judged by, and these religious leaders were doing the very opposite. In a word, they were graceless. They were graceless towards others. And I think that's a great diagnosis of hypocrisy. When we have no grace for other people, that's a telltale sign that we're not living by grace ourselves. Any attempt to live the Christian life apart from pure grace is going to end up leading us into some form of hypocrisy. Some form of trying to convince God, trying to convince others, trying to convince ourselves that we measure up, that we're worthy of God's love and acceptance. And when we realize that we're not making it, we're tempted to fake it. Listen, hypocrisy is no different than any other sin. At the heart, Hypocrisy and all other sin is really idolatry. It's substituting something else for Jesus, for the grace of God in the gospel. In this case, approval, idolatry. And listen, it's easy to see it in others, right? Sometimes you, you read the Pharisees and the scribes, and it's like a cartoon, right? They seem like cartoon characters. How can these guys be so thick-headed? But listen... They're not the only ones guilty of hypocrisy. Listen, at times, all of us, all of us, guilty as charged, we all try to present ourselves as something we're not. We want others to think more highly of us than we think they will if we just be ourselves. If we're honest about who we really are, we're concerned that people will not love us, will not accept us. And listen, all too often we crave the love and acceptance and approval of others because we don't believe that we already have those things 
freely given to us by God because of Jesus. And so what we end up doing is putting forward a fake version of ourselves to get that love and approval from others. We put forward the person that we wish we were, the person that we think other people will like instead of who we are. Because the reality is that we don't believe God loves us as much as the Bible says that he does. Or we don't believe that that love will truly satisfy. And that unbelief leads to idolatry in all kinds of forms. And one of those is hypocrisy. And that's exactly where Jesus goes next in verse 5. He points out what these religious leaders were doing. They were doing good works simply as an act of worship to the Lord wasn't enough. So instead... They end up doing all of their religious activity, all of their charitable deeds before the eyes of men to bolster their religious image, to earn an honorable name for themselves, to earn honorable position. And that's just really another play ripped from the Sermon on the Mount playbook. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, Jesus clearly calls out hypocrites and says, look, if you're practicing your works in public, sounding the trumpet so everybody can see you, that's really the definition of hypocrisy. So that they can gain notoriety, so that they can gain the approval of men. They only, the, the, the religious leaders were only performing when the spotlight was there's a famous video clip of a press conference of a, of a great basketball player named Allen Iverson. Some of you, if you've been around basketball, you know what I'm talking about. But I think it'll help us understand what we're talking about here. And in this press conference, Allen Iverson is talking about some issues that he's having with his coaches. Now listen, Allen Iverson will likely be in the Hall of Fame one day because he was a great scorer, but listen, he was never known as a good teammate. Um, that's, that's kind of an understatement. But let me read you a couple lines from the transcript of this interview, and, and I think you'll catch on to where we're going. This is what he said. We're sitting here, and I'm supposed to be a franchise player, and all we're talking about is practice. I mean, listen, we're talking about practice. Not a game, not a game. Not a game. We're talking about practice, not a game. Not, not the game where I go out there and die, die for and play every game like it's my last. Not the game. We're talking about practice, man. I mean, how silly is that? Iverson's coaches were on him because he kept coming up with all kinds of excuses not to go to practice because... Ultimately, you heard from his own words, he thought it was unimportant. Listen, at practice, the cameras aren't rolling. At practice, the stats aren't being tallied. At practice, none of his adoring fans are cheering his every move. And so in his mind, practice didn't really matter. But come game day, it was all different. He was on center stage. It was showtime, and he was all in. He was only willing to work when people were looking. And that's really at the heart of what we're talking about here. Hypocrisy is never satisfied with an audience of one. Hypocrisy is never satisfied with knowing that God and God alone has seen what we've done. It craves the applause of men. How about you? Are you okay if no one ever sees, no one ever knows what you've done for the Lord, what you've sacrificed for Him? If you're not, I think it's safe to say that what you've done wasn't for the Lord. 
receives, from what you can tell, a tangible reward, this side of heaven, is doing it as a sacrifice of praise to the one who's done it all in our place enough. If you're thinking, I'm, I'm not sure. I think I'm doing it for the Lord. But how do I know for sure? That's where we're going next. Jesus reveals the alternative and the cure for hypocrisy. Verse 8. For you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man father in earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructor, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. So Jesus picks up in verse 7 where he left off, excuse me, in verse 8 where he left off in verse 7, and that's the whole idea of titles. And in verse 8, he says, call no man rabbi. In verse 9, he says, call no man father. In verse 10, he says, call no man instructor. Some of your Bible translations might say, instead of instructor, master or teacher. It all kind of carries the same meaning. But why is Jesus making such a big deal out of this? Big deal. And if it is, what does that mean for us today? Is it a violation of Jesus' teaching to say, Pastor Jeff? Or for the kids to say, Teacher Lynn? The short answer is no. And, and here's why. I'm not saying that so you can call me all kinds of puffed up. <laughs> here's why. What Jesus is combating is not the universal use of titles. What he's battling is what's connected with those titles. He doesn't just forbid it, but he tells us why he's forbidding it. For instance, he says, don't call someone instructor or master in verses 8, verse 10, because, listen, you're all brothers, and you have only one instructor, one master, the Christ, the Messiah. Now, what he's not saying is that nobody else besides me, besides Jesus, could teach his disciples anything. That, that, that's not what he was saying, because you have to look at the cultural context. In the first century, in Jewish culture, to be someone's teacher didn't simply mean that you learned something. If someone was your teacher, it didn't just mean that you learned something from them. Or it doesn't mean what it means to be a pastor today, that a pastor teaches and cares for those he leads. In first century Jewish culture, if someone was your instructor or your master, you were actually committed to that rabbi. You were committed to their way of thinking. You were committed to their way of life. You became a disciple of that rabbi, not just of the one they were teaching you about. You became that you became a a disciple of the rabbi, not the God they were teaching you about. Listen, that's completely different than what we're doing today. Jeff and I are not interested in turning you guys into Jeffanites or Charlians, all right? Our goal as your pastors is for you to become disciples of the same person we're disciples of. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And our role is to proclaim him and to point you to him away from ourselves and towards our joint Savior. And the last title that Jesus shoots down is Father. And I think this is a direct shot at the pride of the Jews and something that they continually hung over the heads of the Gentiles, right? That the Jews often said, hey, I don't know about all you guys, but Abraham is our father, and that means we're all that. Um, and unfortunately, you guys aren't. And Jesus says, nice try. You have but one spiritual father, and his bones aren't buried there. He lives in heaven. It's not your Jewish lineage that makes you a child of God. No man is your spiritual father. No man is in charge of your spiritual 
inheritance. Your God, or your Father, is God if you're a child of God. So the, the real issue with the religious leaders and the way they saw these titles and this leadership is that they saw themselves climbing a spiritual ladder of success so that one day they could be worthy of being called master, instructor, leader, father. But they completely missed what Jesus was teaching, and that is that the greatest among you doesn't go by any of those names. The greatest among you, he or she, went by another name, and that name was servant. Servant. And then Jesus finally gave them the antidote for the poison of hypocrisy in verse 12, when he says, the humble will be exalted, and if you exalt yourself, you'll be humbled. Humility is the cure for hypocrisy. Now, that sounds good. It would look really good on a coffee mug. But, but what does that mean, and how does that work? Listen, we've already said that at the heart of the issue, hypocrisy is just another form of idolatry, exalting self, idolizing approval from others. And the cure for idolatry is always, always, always the same. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what we're looking to instead of Jesus for self-worth, for acceptance, for love, for security, whatever it is, it will leave you unfulfilled trying to justify yourself, trying to prove that you're good enough, that you're worthy enough, and it will lead to hypocrisy. Only God's unconditional, one-way love poured out to you, not at your best moment, but at your most unlovely moments, given to you based purely and solely on what Jesus did for you at the cross, not what you've done for him, only that can set you free from the bondage of trying to be something that you're not. And only knowing that I'm deeply loved, not because of my great faith or my spiritual prowess, but in spite of my propensity to disbelieve, in spite of my propensity to wander away from the one who's holding on to me. That truth is deeply humbling. You see, humility doesn't come from trying to be humble, from trying to stir up humility in ourselves. Humility comes from bowing down to something bigger than ourselves and allowing someone else to occupy the place of honor in our lives, someone else to capture our thoughts, our affections, and our attention. I think the words of C.S. Lewis are really helpful here. He said this, true humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. You see, constantly putting ourselves down, that's not humility. That's just an inverted form of pride. Because I'm still thinking about myself all the time. I'm just painting a woe is me picture. Humility is driven by a deepening understanding and reliance upon the grace of God because of what Jesus has done for us. The cure for hypocrisy is gospel-driven humility. And the Pharisees and the scribes sure could have used those. So at this point, Jesus now turns his attention back to the hypocrisy of the religious leaders, and he begins to unpack what that looks like. So Jesus now shows us how unchecked hypocrisy plays out in the life of people. So we're going to walk through these seven woes, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on each one of them, but we're going to kind of paint with broad brush strokes to give, to, to eventually create a painting of what hypocrisy looks like. And as we do, 
we're going to have a few takeaways along the way and quite a few warnings about uh, how we can get ourselves get caught up in hypocrisy if we're not focused on what Jesus has done for us. Verse 13, But woe be you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, gracelessness and setting up roadblocks for other peoples is a sure sign of hypocrisy, right? We, we want to think more of ourselves, so we make it more difficult for other people. Now listen, this, is a, uh, this, terif this verse terrifies me. It's scary to think that we can end up misrepresenting God's attitude towards other people painting him to be more angry and more difficult to please than he actually is. Hypocrisy does that. It tries to appear spiritually superior to others. So instead of drawing people to Christ with his love, with his grace, with the good news, we can end up driving people away by painting a caricature, a t an angry task manager, taskmaster caricature of who God is. And instead, instead of proclaiming his good news, we can end up shutting up the kingdom of God to others. Verse 15, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you travel across the sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. A proselyte means a convert, right? And in this case, a convert to Judaism. Unfortunately, if the person that is creating a convert is a hypocrite themselves, if the discipler is a hypocrite, what kind of disciple do you think they're going to create? That's what Jesus is pointing out. So if your motive for traveling around the world is to look spiritual and to look like you care about others, instead of actually caring about them. And once you lead them to faith, your example to them is hypocrisy. That's just not going to end well. And as Jesus says, twice the son of hell as you. Verse 16, Woe to you blind guides who say, If anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by the oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift on the altar or that that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by, him, swears by the altar swears by it and everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears... By heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. Well, but really confusing, right? And, and Jesus is pointing out how confusing they've made it, right? And notice this is the only woe in all of the woes, all the only woe in all the woes, woe, 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 woe um, that doesn't that isn't followed by the accusation hypocrites. And, and I believe that's because this is not an act of hypocrisy that Jesus is describing. Hypocrisy is willfully pretending that you're something that you're not, or willful pretending to be someone that you're not. And, and that's not what's going on here. In this case, it's, it appears that the religious leaders have been pretending so long that they've started believing some of the things that they've been pretending to be saying and doing. And so he doesn't call them hypocrites. This time he calls them blind guides in verse 16, and blind fools in verse 17. So instead of being pretenders, now they're just fools. Not really sure that's an upgrade, but it's different. And their foolishness really becomes obvious as Jesus begins to unpack this whole nonsense about oaths, that they've been swearing by this and that. And Jesus calls them on it in verses 16 through 20 that I just read you, that they were swearing by the temple or by the gold in the temple or by the altar or by this or by that and assigning different levels of significance to this oath and that oath. And Jesus is 
is, he's not trying to sort it all out. He's showing them the, their, their flawed logic and how foolish all of this is. And, and he's just showing them and showing us that when we try to appear holier than we are, it actually makes us begin to do foolish things and we can begin to lose sight of what true holiness actually looks like. We can begin to lose sight of how holy, how different, how other than us God really is. It's blinded the scribes and the Pharisees. They no longer recognize the holiness of God. And as I mentioned, that was the only woe without a hypocrite to follow. Well, Jesus makes up for that because the next one includes a hypocrite and a blind guy reference. Verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. You ought to have done, uh, these you ought to have done without neglecting the others, you blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. So Jesus referred to, I believe he referred to the Sermon on the Mount earlier, and I think here he's referring to some of his other teachings a few weeks ago when we were in Matthew 15. You might remember Jesus talking about how the religious Jews had kind of worked the system to get out of caring for their elder, their aging parents, right? They were pretending to be super holy and say, my money, my stuff, my house, my livestock, those are dedicated to the Lord. And so how could I possibly use those to take care of my parents? That would be robbing from God, so I'm just going to hang on to them because those are dedicated to the Lord. It's exactly the kind of thing that Jesus is talking about here. You've neglected justice and mercy to try to put on this super holy religious look. Their hypocrisy had them focusing on foolish details about nonsense. And they were neglecting the plain things like justice and mercy. Their nonsense and their foolishness could be seen by others as holy. But they were unwilling to do works of justice and mercy in secret. Verse 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the club, cup and the plate, but instead they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the club, cup and the plate, that the outside may also be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. So you are also... So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. That really gets to the heart of it, doesn't it? Right? The heart of the matter is always a matter of the heart. And that's what Jesus is continuing to communicate here. If you, were, if you went back and reread this whole chapter, chapter 23, and then you went back and you read all of the Sermon on the Mount, one thing would stand out to you, and that is Jesus is not talking about outward behavior, outward performance at all. He's not talking about living up to a certain way of living or a certain moral code. Now, he's not talking about less than that. He's actually talking about more than that. It's never about simply acting or appearing to behave a certain way. It's always about the motive behind it. Now listen, our behavior might change, and it should, but our behavioral modification is never an end in itself. Anybody can fake those things, right? There's all kinds of behavioral programs just go to the self-help section at Barnes & Noble and you'll find all kinds of ways to change your behavior. But Jesus is talking about changing the heart. And there's good reason for that because Jesus recognizes that if we're trying to live up to a moral code as a means of righteousness, 
as a means to justify ourselves or prove our spiritual maturity or our love to God, that will always lead us away from the gospel, not towards it, right? If we're trying to do it on our own, by our own effort, it will eventually lead to pride if we think that we can somehow be good enough to earn something from God by our good behavior. Or, on the other hand, it can also lead to hypocrisy if we realize that we're not living up to it, but we put on a show like we actually are. And that's when the story goes from bad to tragic. Verse 29. Woe be you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build tombs of the prophet and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we wouldn't have taken part in them shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify some of whom you will flog in the synagogues and persecute from town to town. Just a quick break there. There's a prophetic, in case you didn't pick up on it, there's a prophetic couple verses there, and that is Jesus is talking about what was going to be done to him and also to the apostles, because he talks about crucifixion. Crucifixion was not the normal Jewish way of capital punishment. That was stoning. But he's talking about crucifixion here, talking about what was going to happen to them. It's clearly pointing to his crucifixion coming. And then he talks about people being flogged in the synagogues and persecuted from town to town. Right? The synagogues didn't even exist in the Old Testament during the Old Testament prophet times. And so he's, he's talking about that. And this is what's going to happen to the apostles that were proclaiming his resurrection after after he'd be raised from the dead. So those are a couple of prophetic verses. Verse 35. So that so that on you may come, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth. From, from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who were sent out to it. How often would I have gathered you as children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? And you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Israel had a bad track record of killing those who God sent to them. They literally shot the messenger. Um, and, and he gives a reference, right, from Abel, the first murder that occurred, all the way to Zechariah, the last prophet killed. And he said, this, this is your history, and it's not going to end here, because he prophesied that they would kill him as well. But it was always the same story. They had convinced themselves that they were God's people, God's chosen. They were living up to his standards. They were good enough. And then God would send a prophet to them to say just the opposite, to point them back to trusting in the mercy of God instead of going their own way as they did so many times. And then they would become angry with that prophet and eventually kill them. Listen. That is a pattern that was repeated over and over again. That is what looking purely to ourselves, to our ability to live up to some standard does to us. That is the hardness that it brings. But as followers of Jesus, we've been set free from that cycle of trying to justify ourselves and then hiding it or faking it when we fail. We've been given a righteousness outside of ourselves that's not our own. It was purchased for us on a cross 2,000 years ago and given to us as a gift of grace that we receive by faith. We don't need to pretend 
anymore. We already have the love that we crave. So we don't have to pretend like we deserve it. Instead, instead, we're free to live for the glory of the one who first loved me, purely as an act of worship and love to the one who did it all in my life. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word that even though, even in the rebukes, the good news of the gospel rings loud and clear in the halls of the church. So Lord, help us to remember what we've been given in you. And Lord, we don't need to be hypocrites because all that we long for, all that's worth thinking for has already been given to us, has already been purchased for us. So Lord, help us to lay hold of that as we move into another year. As we move into 2015, Lord, may the message of what you've done for us, what you've done in our place, take an even tighter grip on our hearts. And may it change us. May we be changed by grace so that we might be gracious to others. So Lord, I do pray for Impact Church as we move into a new year. Lord, we ask your blessings upon this place. We ask that you would use us as a mouthpiece for the gospel. Lord, that you would use us as a hospital to the hurting. Lord, that you would use us as a gym for those who need to be built up. And so Lord, we, we look forward to all that you're going to do this year. And we thank you for that. We pray these things. This is your